Hello and welcome back to Remind and Renew 2021 at Phillips Theological Seminary for our second panelist discussion on the topic, Responding to Conquered Bodies and Destroyed Lives. I'm Dr. Peter Capretto, Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care and Religion and Culture here at Phillips, and I once again have the privilege of moderating a conversation with our three distinguished speakers who have now gifted us with a second round of rigorous and theologically moving lectures today. While many of you now know them well, allow me to very briefly reintroduce our speakers for our conversation. Our first panelist, again, is Dr. Lee H. Butler, Jr., Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dean and William Tavernay, Professor of the History of Religions and Africana Pastoral Theology here at Phillips Theological Seminary. Welcome back, Dean Butler. Our second panelist is Dr. Laurel C. Schneider, Professor of and Chair of Religious Studies at Vanderbilt University and Executive Committee Member of the Board of the American Academy of Religion. Welcome back, Dr. Schneider. And our third panelist is Dr. George Tink Tinker, Professor Emeritus at the <coughs> Iliff School of Theology, where he spent decades as a leading theological educator and researcher in American Indian cultures, history, and religious traditions, among many other things. Welcome back, Dr. Tinker. Very cool. For those of you who are joining us today for the first time, uh, I will uh, remind you that our panelists will be taking select audience questions later in the hour. So once again, we invite you now to begin gathering your thoughts and your questions in our designated Q&A panel in our Zoom webinar. Uh, if uh, you were able to join their lectures, uh, they will give lots of uh, room for discussion. We've now had about six hours of meaningful content from them over the last two days. So that is a true gift for our own edification. But with this structure in mind, I, I will say that uh, the Phillips community has had the gift over the last two days of hearing from all of you in the meaningful research and work that you do, but not everyone knows that the three of you have a long history of collaboration, solidarity, and work together. So before we turn to some questions from our audience, I would love to invite the three of you could you share with us a little bit about your history and the things that have brought you and your stories to cross paths and how that has impacted the trajectory of your work and scholarship? Well, since this event is being sponsored by Phillips Seminary, I think that I will begin <laughs> uh, speaking uh, about some of our, our history together. And it has been um, uh, woven and overlapping in, in many different ways. Um, I first met Professor Tinker uh, during my early days of working with the ATS. And in that work, uh, ATS was uh, through the Committee on Race and Ethnicity, bringing uh, scholars of color together to talk with one another, to talk about the challenges of theological education. And it was at one of those events where uh, Professor Tinker was a speaker that I first met him, first really encountered him uh, in, in his embodied self. And I can't remember exactly what he said in one of his lectures, but I do remember, I mean, what he said in terms of what prompted this, but I do remember, uh, Dr. Dolores Williams, after Tink spoke, she was like, yes, Tink, I'm coming to join your church because he was really criticizing, um, critiquing church and Christianity quite strongly and the, the ways that the church tends to emphasize thir certain things that become destructive and dehumanizing of, of other people. And, and Dolores Williams had this, this spiritual reaction that said, Amen, I'm with you. And uh, we've had other encounters since then, uh, more personal. Um, uh, and let me switch over to, to uh, Professor Snyder because our time together uh, began at Chicago Seminary where we began as colleagues. Uh, we became close, dear friends and that transitioned us into being family to one another. And so uh, we walk together, we talk together, we let everyone that we encounter know that we belong to one another. <laughs> um, 
And as um, uh, Tink identified, Sand Creek Massacre, um, and I, I named it in, in my uh, presentation this afternoon, it was actually Laurel who pointed me to that massacre where I was having conversation with her saying, look, well, I've been studying the lynching and I'm moving into uh, looking at Native American genocide and trauma. Where should I start? And she said, Sand Creek. Methodist minister led it. And so um, that also then connected me back to Tink at another point when I was uh, doing archival research of the massacre there in Denver. Go ahead, Laurel, I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Well, I, um, Dean Butler has, has, I think, said some of the most salient, uh, most salient points in regard to my connection um, there. I, I, I have to say it was, I, I have learned more from him um, than just about anyone. And, um, and our, our, we were both onlys at uh, Chicago Theological Seminary and understood a kind of um, camaraderie that and, and a need to understand each other. Um, and so I, can, I do consider him a family member. Um, at my wedding, he uh, referred to me as, uh, as his sister when he gave a toast. And I have one biological brother who at that point had been slouching most of the time and he sat bolt upright. <laughs> Who is this? And uh, that's, that's been a, a laugh between uh, Dean Butler and me ever since. Um, my, own, my own entree into um, the study of um, Native American histories and experiences and traditions started for me um, in college. Uh, and uh, I, I, I was part of a, I was a student in, um, in the American Indian Studies program at Dartmouth College. And um, that carried through as an area of interest, specific interest for me, um, and became one of pretty profound personal uh, interest in, in long-term relationships. And, um, and then when I began my theological studies at the doctoral level at Vanderbilt, um, Howard Herod became my mentor there, mm -hmm. and um, and I, when he became sick with uh, prostate cancer, he asked me to take his course in the introduction to Native American religious traditions. And there's nothing like having to teach something um, to teach you something. Um, so it entered into my 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 way of thinking. Um, and over time, in my my own theological writing. As my anti-racist commitments continued, um, also um, focusing in meth as much as possible and learning more and more um, how to how to challenge my own assumptions and um, using feminism to help unbuild the structures um, that that. That have kept um, that have kept me from understanding, as well as um, many of the literatures, um, poetry, and literatures and philosophies that uh, that te continue to teach me. That has then now come into my theological thinking in some really profound ways. I can't separate um, those learnings and those teachings from now the way that I think and the continued learning that that I need to do. So uh, in that, of course, um, um, Dr. Tinker's theological work is very, very significant for me um, as a, particularly as a young theologian, trying to think through any number of um, be, being able to build on the writings of Vine Deloria and so forth, to be able to understand even more how a constructive theologian might, um, might be able to think um, more clearly. So I can go on, but that's both of these, both of these individuals are key intellectual um, influences on me. 
away. I'll touch so many memories. That session in Pittsburgh with the ATS was uh, was a fascinating moment, Lee. Uh, we, we, we came in with our deans, about 30 deans brought in a faculty of color from their seminaries. All 30 deans were white. <laughs> That's obviously beginning to change Dean Butler. <laughs> but back then that was the case. Fascinating moment and, and, and made for some communication that really demonstrated how white deans and their faculty of color were speaking quite past one another most of the time. Uh, and you, you, Laurel, are referencing Vine Delaria, who's uh, one of my main mentors. And uh, just as I lament the, the loss of Vincent Harding on my faculty, uh, it was not long after Vincent's death that I also lost uh, Vine Delaria. Uh, just terrible losses for uh, an, an old guy who uh, thought I was going to have those people around for a long time yet. <laughs> but that's been, that's been my discourse, intellectual discourse. I would call it my theological discourse, but the whole concept of theos is foreign to me. The more I become entrenched in my Indian identity, and of course, the whole notion of the Greek concept of logos is equally abstract and hard for me to wrap my mind around, but it's what I talk about. <laughs> it's invested in that verb. Kakuna. Good to be here and good to be with all of you. Well, I very much appreciate you sharing. Perhaps in the, the vein of this, if it is okay, uh, we already have uh, some questions, some lingering from yesterday and some also today that I think build upon this. One, I think, uh, question that is on the minds of a lot of people that uh, relates to issues of uh, continued themes of translation and advocacy uh, from a Phillips librarian, uh, Avery Weldon. Uh, she asks uh, for the panel, and this is building from yesterday's conversation as a transition, quote, what is the best way to lift up the voice of oppressed communities when there isn't a shared narrative frame? So specifically in those moments where there are these concepts that do not translate very easily, what, what is your advice on best methods for lifting up the voice of oppressed communities when there are translational issues. I'll jump on that one and then get out of the way. But I think I think it's an important question. But, but one that has to begin with privileging the voice of the oppressed. Period. I, and with all due respect for those who have carved out careers, being in solidarity with American Indians, uh, and the work that, that, that they do, including, including Laurel, you've got to look for Indian voices if you want to know what's going on in the Indian world. And, and, and that's easier and easier because there are more and more public Indian voices, more and more Indian media, media uh, not just Indian media, but, but uh, podcasts like Nick Estes, uh, in his Red Nation podcast, really important stuff where he brings together all kinds of voices uh, and, and key, key academic writers, key cultural writers, um, like Leanne Betasama Soki Simpson, who's a Canadian after all, but still uh, we don't recognize that border, so maybe you all shouldn't pay that close attention to it either. And you need to read uh, Leanne's stuff. It's really powerful, powerful stuff. I'd say that's where to start. I, it's really important to me when I look at people writing about Latin America or South Africa, 
Uh, and I have greatest respect for David Chittister. But when I want to know about South Africa, I'm going to look to South Africans to tell me more than David Chittister, as much as I appreciate, uh, especially his book, Empire of Religion. I am happy to extend this. Uh, we have more questions coming in that may in fact build upon this, but I don't want to cut off uh, Drs. Butler and Schneider. We have another question uh, from someone from the Phillips community, Bradley uh, Evanar, excuse me. Uh, Bradley writes that he has talked to ministers about race relations and social justice issues and why their sermons don't include those topics. The common response is something about making their congregation uncomfortable. The question is, how much responsibility do you think should be placed on church leaders to perform this type of education? And a lot could be said about this, but I think this does certainly relate to this point that you just raised, Dr. Tinker, about bringing in and, and not uh, squashing the voice of others as you're trying to engage in advocacy. I spoke last time. I'm going to let my colleagues start off this time. While Laurel and I were at Chicago Seminary together, uh, Laurel would periodically lift up and we would have uh, disciplinary conversations that would identify the silos, that there would be this statement of practical theology. Laurel would say, well, I don't do impractical theology. And, and, and what she was always driving at there is we are in, as seminary professors, we are in the, the business and work of preparing folks to be competent religious leaders who know how to reflect theologically. And as practical theologians, they have an obligation to reflect theologically that it is our responsibility as pulpit leaders to listen to what's going on in the community, in the larger society, and to bring with theological integrity to the people an interpretation that will build community that is balanced and just, but also calling out those, those injustices that we need to be attentive to if we are really going to be people of faith. Um, and so the way I have worked is to say that we have uh, a profound responsibility of doing justice, of interpreting justice work, of loving and, and, and really uh, describing how we are to live as persons loving one another uh, and walking humbly with one another. So uh, it's not a matter of how much, it's a matter of we must. Yeah, and I, I, I completely agree with that. I think, um, I think that, that the challenge in, in church leadership, um, at least as I, you know, as I have experienced that role, is finding the balance um, between, uh, you know, pedagogy and um, and and affirmation and support. Um, that that the that so many people who come into church communities have such profound places of of, of brokenness and woundedness in their in their lives and are, are capable of shutting down completely. Um, and that part of what it means to be a leader in a community is how do you love these people? And how do you love these people into truth telling and into mm -hmm. the courage to uh, the courage to to hear the truth about their community and its history of violence. Um, that that also gives them an opportunity to um, you know to to begin to understand that. And I, I 
that is hard. That is hard leadership work. It's this balance between um, love and teaching that I like to think is loving teaching. Um, the, the the homiletical and the and, and the leadership task of how how to bring the um, the difficult realities of 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 our tradition into view um, and to say, but that's not all there is. And if there, if, 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 if we can, if we can begin to become better, um, better persons and better allies and better and, and better recipients, we need to start learning how to listen. And part of that is, as Tink was saying, you know, not just listening to ourselves, um, waxing eloquent about our commitments, um, but actually listening to those who have the kinds of experiences that, that can teach us. Now that's a sort of roundabout way, I think of saying, we, we, can't, we can't back off. Um, backing off is granting, it's, it, 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 it's, granting a, um, it's granting the narrative to those who, um, who, who, who deny the truth. But it is also it's it it it's probably for I'm I'm talking to to white pastors right now in my mind. Um, it is I think the most important work we could possibly have in our lives is to learn how to and is to keep at um, the the task of um, of loving and teaching that recognizes every day. How do I how do I bring this story forward? How do I who who needs to be at the table for uh, who who needs to be listened to? Who's not been listened to? Who's been marginalized? Vine Deloria said, you know, all right, white people, shut up and listen. Right? We we don't know how to listen. So, task number one: listen. And I think let me just add, and I think what that does. If my leadership task can be how can I how can we learn to listen, um, it can also be learning then how how to become how to become better participants. Um, that listening is not passive; listening is learning. During my uh, time at ILF. What I had to say in the classroom was really different than how I spoke when I was downtown at Four Winds American Indian Council, where uh, uh, you know, we had a, an, an urban Indian ceremony uh, once a week. But I would, I'll have to say this, I pushed Indians as hard as I pushed white students at ILF just in a different way. If any preacher thinks her or his job is to not disturb the comfort of people in the pews, that, that preacher is doing a disservice to her or his congregation. Um, I spent 25 years, almost 30 years, co-teaching a course with uh, my colleague Jean Miller-Schmidt, the American church historian at ILF. Jean invited me to come in and, and be a partner in her course, Christianity and the Modern World. Now, I have to say, I've spent a number of years teaching that course, struggling with how to say hard stuff in more and more hearable uh, language without alienating white students. And of course, Eventually, it seemed to work for 90% of the classroom, maybe even 95%. The outliers were always white men, with one exception. I remember one woman who took me on, but they were so rooted in their own vision of Euro-Christian romance that they could not deal with the fact that Christians were deeply involved in the violence committed on this continent, whether it was against Indians or, 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 or Blacks or Asians or, or, or Latinos. 
uh, you know, the two main perpetrators and a host of the others at Sand Creek in that massacre in 18, 1864 were passionate Christians. Uh, John, John Evans started three Methodist academic institutions, including Northwestern University, Garrett Evangelical uh, Theological Seminary, and the University of Denver, and was part of starting Isla School of Theology, although it was at that point still the religion department of the University of Denver. Yet, even in 1884, he continued in an interview with H.H. H. Bancroft, the historian from the University of California, to defend the massacre at Sand Creek because it made Colorado safe for Christian occupancy. White people got to know that. Christians got to know that. And, and they've got to tell me what they're going to to do with it because Indian people are going to hold Methodists particularly because Evans was a Methodist accountable for that. They're going to hold Presbyterians accountable for Andrew Jackson. Episcopalians accountable for George Washington uh, doing speculative land purchasing uh, in the Ohio Valley and then sending his armies to conquer the Ohio Valley Confederacy so he could actually turn his speculative interests in land into hard cash. Mm -hmm. And those guys became wealthy, all of them. Kakuna. We have a, a number of questions coming in. If, if, if I may, one really interesting thing that I, I just heard coming through, Dr. Schneider raising this question, of, raising this charge that faith leaders, particularly faith leaders in positions of privilege, need to become better listeners uh, and that this task is not easy. And Dr. Tinker, I, I heard, if I'm not mistaken, you saying that a lot of your task in theological education was in empowering people, especially to preach on hard issues, educating them on ways to make that make those messages legible essentially to their congregation so that it wasn't immediately always perhaps a fracturing moment that you they took a course with you and then suddenly their their church divided the next week because they uh, they hit, hit everyone over the head with uh, a message that was uh, presented in a way that was uh, perhaps unnecessarily divisive or at least one that didn't really invite people in. So my question to you on this, because these are two sides of the same coin, how is it that we become listeners and how do we also prime our messages for other people to listen to them? I guess my question to you and to, to everyone here is, what does, that, what does that education look like for faith leaders who are asking themselves, I want to be challenging my congregations right now. I want to be inviting people into these conversations, but I know deep down in my heart that there are going to be people who aren't going to receive this. How, how do you advise them to essentially tailor these messages to invite as many people in as possible? Or is this perhaps something that isn't their worry? That perhaps they should just speak the truth as plainly and as unfiltered as possible, and those who leave, leave, and those who stay, stay. Well, I'll, I'll jump in to at least start. Uh, I, you know, I, I do think that, you, you know, you're, you're not going to convince everybody. And, and I think that isn't that isn't your job. Sure. Right. It's not your job to convince everybody. But it is. And, and, you know, how do you how do you teach people to listen? I think you model it. I think you find ways to be to be the kind of person in invisible ways, which for white people, I think, you know, we, we don't have models of listening. We have models of talking, 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 arguing, arguing, arguing. We don't, we, we, we don't have very many models of that. And I think that, that religious leaders who have been trained with a valorization of leadership, I mean, <laughs> Dr. Butler may remember this, but I, I used to say, you know, 
all of our lingo is about making leaders, making leaders, making leaders. And we really don't talk about what it means to listen and follow. Um, and that's a kind of leadership too. Um, so what does it mean to model listening to hard things mm. in a community um, to show that you can survive hearing hard things about yourself, about your people, about your past. You, you can get up and survive that. It's not going to kill you. And in fact, le learning to listen and learning to, to sit with and not just immediately defend, not immediately come back, but to sit with and to say, what do I learn from this? What do I need to learn? What more do I need to know? Who do, who's, who's, who's missing here? Who can help? Who can help? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing, I think, modeling. And the other form of modeling, um, there's, a, there's a wonderful preacher here in Nashville um, who has an incredible gift of bringing the, the hardest kinds of issues into her predominantly privileged white congregation. Um, I, I've watched her do this because it was brought to my attention that, she, that she's good at this. And she uses herself. She uses herself as the one who is in need of learning from the hard lesson in this biblical text that is really about what's happening today, that really is about the racial violence in our city today, that really is, and, and the, the capacity, and I'm sure many, you know, many um, graduates of, of, of Phillips Theological Seminary know how to do this. It's, it, 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 it is a way of saying to people, we're in this together, we're in this together. And as, as the person here preaching, I am demonstrating a learning that applies to me. So it's not so much you, you people, you have to do this. You, that's, that's a piece of how white supremacy works is telling everybody else, you know, running around and, and telling everybody else what to do. Yeah, I'll second what Dr. Schneider is saying. If I'm gonna ask white audiences, your Christians, to make themselves vulnerable, I, I've got to signal to them that I'm willing to make myself vulnerable as well. It's that simple, I think, it's, and that hard. That, that's not. It's not easy. A simple task. One of the things that I so appreciated from uh, Dean Butler's lecture this afternoon was the paralleling of a hundred years ago in Tulsa to to this year, and and the, the multiple layers of parallel, um, and I think that's a wonderful example of the kind of approach that one can take in a community, and to say we are you know we are living out a history that you know that that we that we must take on, um, and and think about. Where do we go from here? What do we do with the repetitions um, and, and our, you know, our best commitments and efforts to keep those repetitions from happening? Let's be good strategists. Let's recognize that we are in this, in, in, it's happening again. What can we do differently this time that wasn't done then? How can we interrupt differently this time? And people love to strategize. People love to be included in problem solving. If we say this is a problem we all have, we have, op we have multiple options to try and come up with better, better approaches than, than the past. Um, but it is our past. We are here in this place where these things have happened and are repeating themselves. Um, you know, where, where racial violence is, is, is authorized um, and so forth. Anyway, I'll stop talking. I have pl plenty of questions from the audience still. I, I'm curious about this, this preacher I want to, in Nashville, I want to learn from her and, and see how she models this. Uh, for her congregation. Uh, but I do have a question from Kyle Miller Shawnee. Uh, Kyle asks, uh, narrating first, quote, I've been thinking about the theology of hopelessness that we 
spoke about yesterday, uh, within my own context, working with queer populations, especially for those of us, those that have experienced religious trauma by and from the church, hope seems to be a central pillar upon which healing occurs. The question is, does a theology of hopelessness require some sort of recognition of one's economic, spiritual, and physical privilege? I guess that's tailored for me since I raised the issue of uh, Miguel de la Torre's theology of hopelessness. And, and uh, I would say certainly not, not, not for de la Torre and not for me. Uh, I mean, de la Torre has written another book in, in, I can't remember the Spanish, but in English, you'll have to excuse my rough translation, is uh, Theology of Those Who Are Fucked. Um, I, I, he really is speaking from the margins. And I'm speaking from the poorest of the poor in North America, the uh, ethnic community that is by far uh, per capita, the poorest community, the most, uh, the highest unemployment. Our unemployment can average sometimes uh, up to ten times the African American unemployment rate. So that that that's where we are. Nobody knows, simply because uh, we're such a small part of the population, and a lot of that unemployment is parked on uh, uh, on distant reservations that are off the beaten track. You know, places like Rosebud and Pine Ridge. Uh, no, I don't think it requires privilege. In fact, I think hope requires privilege. And if we, you read Jürgen Moltmann's Theology of Hope, you can see where, you know, an affluent white German Lutheran can afford to be hopeful in, in ways that those of us on the margins cannot. Now, in, in terms of, of uh, your questioner's comment about serving those who are uh, uh, queer and oppressed, um, that doesn't pertain to American Indians so much because we never did single out our queer populations as somehow abhorrent or abject. Mm. The Osage Nation had a, a society of queer men called, uh, called kettle carriers, mitseki, uh, that were central to all the ceremonies. Uh, in the same way, you know, we're we're just culturally worldview so different. You know, our cultures have tended to be strongly matriarchal, matrilocal, uh, so that uh, uh, for us the real question isn't hope; it's back to harmony and balance. And it's those in-between genders that help us maintain balance between male and female, light and dark, day and night, north and south. Uh, that's really what's important for us. I think that, oh, sorry. No, no, go right ahead. Um, <clears throat> that, you know, the, the various, various, Queer communities are ones that I work with as well, and and I think separating <laughs> this concept of of hope as a, as some kind of abstraction from the specificity of the context in, in which instead of just hope, we have to say, well, what do you what 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 are you hoping for? Mm -hmm. Right? What's 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 the content of it? Otherwise, it is just an abstraction, um, and I think that that you know to to hope not to commit suicide um you know is is a hope right that's a hope and and it's a real hope it's a specific hope um it it, it is a you know it it becomes then a question i think f in in ministry for um you know what what lights the path um 
what gives some light into the into the pathway um, so that there is even a, a sense that I that I should I should take a step forward. Is it a daughter, right? Is it a daughter that that as as we were saying yesterday, is it is it some other what is the content of it? And I think that um, that is a contextual question that can't be answered abstractly, um, but that but that is a, a, a is a basis of a of a different kind of of theological um, engagement um, that that recognizes the the specificity of people's lives. Now, I do want to say something about an abstraction there, and and um, um, the the there is a whole element of queer theory that takes on the idea of hope. Again, giving it the content of heteronormative, reproductive, you yeah. know, the hope for the future is the hope for the, for the reproduction of the same, which is the reproduction of the very things that kill us, right? So don't have that hope, right? That sort of <laughs> argument of uh, Lee Edelman's "no future" um, is is a is a is an argument of protest, and and I and and you know Miguel is saying a similar thing. I, I my statement is one of protest against that. Let's make America great again. I I hope for America to be great again. Right? That's don't give me that hope. Right? Don't give me don't so. I, I th for me, it comes back down to the specificity of the content of it. Um, and I think it is incredibly important to know your own community and to know where the wounds are and, um, and to respond to those wounds in a way that, you know, that, that, that helps um, making a way out of no way. Yes. Um. There are a few things that, that Laurel, you just said that, that really resonate with me and, and how we approach uh, Kyle's question. And I, and, and I think it even goes back to what Tink was, was pointing to, that before we can talk about uh, this theology of hopelessness uh, for the community which you're, you're looking at, it is really vitally important that folks are able to clearly recognize where they stand. And I think that's where you're asking the question, does it require the recognition of the economic, spiritual, physical privilege? So it's really, who am I and where am I standing before I can start talking about a new kind of theology that uh, might press me or um, move me to becoming yet a new creature? Uh, we each carry a theology. We, we're, we're all theologians before we encounter the theology of another in written text or, or a new uh, theological reflection. And so I've been trying to remember, because I, I heard uh, Miguel uh, present on this theology of hopelessness when the book first came out. And and I think, if I remember correctly, one of the things he was really emphasizing in that lecture was that so many of us have been encouraged to uh, think of life through the lens of a theology of hope. Oh, yes. So when we are in these despairing uh, positions that we only can understand our way of coming out of despair is if we grab hold to these images and ideas and we now model our lives after what has been declared as this should be your hope. Mm -hmm. And he's saying from the communities that I know best, the communities that I come out of, we have not survived by grabbing hold of these images that are outside of ourselves, but is looking at the resources of the community itself the resources of the community that say, I'm going to live in spite of and despite the death dealing that is coming at me. And so the theology of hopelessness is really, is really valuing one's um, community and the resources that have ensured the survival of 
your people. And so, yeah, it's important that folks recognize who they are, where they are. And quite often those images and ideas that uh, are defining of a quality of life have us moving away from and denying mm -hmm. the uh, resources of our communities of origin. And so let's not strive to become uh, something based upon uh, an image that, uh, I'll make it you know, most clear, that there, there, there is the old theology of, if you're going to get into heaven, sisters, you have to become a man. Uh, of, of black folks, if you're going to be truly a Christian, you have to be washed whiter than the snow and become a white person. Uh, that's not, the theology of hope that, that we are working out of, but it's more of a theology of hopelessness because it's going against what the, the, the dominant norm says. You, you said that so much better than I did, Lee. You captured Miguel's spirit in a really good way. I wanna tell one quick story. Miguel and I were with some ILF students, a, a class of a dozen students in Cuernavaca, Mexico, when the idea for that book was born. We spent the day at a squatter town uh, out on the outskirts of Cuernavaca, a town of 20,000 people squatting, building a town there that could be wiped out any morning the bulldozers could come in. And when we were done and we were debriefing that evening, one of the students said, but in that little girl in the one home we visited, 10 year old, in her eyes, I could see hope. And Miguel snapped, he said, you saw hope. I saw a girl who in five years will be selling her body in order to put food on the table. And you could see the romance hope of the students just immediately collapse on itself. They hadn't even considered that this girl's gonna be a prostitute in five years. Mm -hmm. And yet she has little other choice if she's going to help her family survive. Where do we go with that? Well, the, the answer isn't ho hope. The answer is some really, really hard work mm. to change the reality we're in. Kakuna. Now, this conversation is riveting. I, I, if I may, just one small interjection on this was uh, uh, Miguel de la Torre, presented at the Society for Pastoral Theology, I believe in 2019, also on this work. And I asked him, uh, Dr. Butler, I believe you were there. And I asked him very specifically the question about suicide and hopelessness and essentially asked him this very contextually specific question about how, how do you reconcile issues of hopelessness with the experience of many persons uh, in major depression and he, he seemed to, I, I should be cautious of course, not to speak for him, but he seemed to be very clear in his response, the desire is of course not to fetishize hopelessness as the sort of indulgent despair that leads to things like a suicide and uh, being catatonic in one's action. So uh, I think that he at least spoke to me very clearly uh, about, yes, it's not this, again, just dramatic uh, fetishization of hopelessness. At call, mm -hmm. that's right. We have, well, we have a little more than five minutes remaining in our time together. Perhaps I will turn it over to you. I could ask you another big question, or I could turn it over to you, our panelists who've been in the hot seat for a while. Are there any lingering issues for those who are joining us today that you feel compelled, you really would love to make sure you have the opportunity to say something about, something that we haven't talked about that 
uh, you feel compelled to bring up in our short time remaining? Peter, could I say, I, there's just one thing I, I would like to ask, and I, I, think, um, I think it's not what either Miguel or you meant, but in, in your quick summary there, um, there may have been a conflation of indulgent indulgence and suicide. And I just, I just want to be careful about that. Um, that, that the, the forces that lead to suicide, I would not want to characterize as self-indulgence. Um, and I don't think that's what you meant. I just wanted to lift up, I think that, um, yeah. And I know, I know how sophisticated your own psychological thinking is. So, um, you know, the complexities in that, so. Thank you for clarifying that. That is, I am in 100% agreement. To, uh, to clarify further, yes, I have sophisticated ideas of depression, suicidality, uh, despair, leading from a number of clinical and philosophical sources. Uh, the, in, in the piece on indulgence, rather, is uh, I think I have had conversations with people on this issue of hopelessness where hopelessness becomes suddenly an edgy, interesting concept to indulge. Right. Right. in almost a sort of emo mindset. So right. uh, the fetishization is not the actual emotional content of that, but rather almost an academic indulgence of, oh, mm -hmm. Dr. Tinker made clear about the futility of some of the issues of, of hope, so I'm going to become mm -hmm. countercultural and become very into issues of hopelessness. You're absolutely correct, and thank you for clarifying that, Dr. Schneider. I will open things again, excuse me. I would say that American Indian uh, fiction is somewhat famous for being both anti-hope and at the same time undyingly optimistic. Now, can you hold those two in, in, uh, in tension with one another? Uh, and, and not just fiction, but in real life here in Denver, for 31 years, we took the streets to protest Columbus Day and the Columbus Day holiday as an act of state-supported hate speech because Columbus murdered people, enslaved Indians, uh, stole from Indians. So I published an article, you know, murderer, slave trader, thief, about Columbus uh, in the Caribbean. For 31 years, we protested Columbus Day to no avail. At no time really did I have any hope that we were going to win that battle, but we took the street anyway to continue the protest. And, and when we finally won the battle a year ago, and the state legislature here took out the Columbus Day state holiday and it started here in Colorado. This was the first state that had a Columbus Day holiday. And the governor signed the legislation on the 5th of April. None of us could go celebrate because we were all locked down in, in home quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm not saying despair. We got to work in spite of that. We've got to find something other than hope in order to generate that, that uh, drive to keep on keeping on. I recall another uh, moment where you stood up and stood against where Iliff was planning uh, a graduation at that church there where some folks uh, are buried, like uh, Chibbington is there. I don't know if Evans is there too, but Chibbington is buried in that Methodist <coughs> church. And uh, you stood and said, I will not participate in a commencement that will be hosted at that church. J just pointing out again, the, the stances that we must take yeah. that, that are against even the institutions in which 
we are uh, embedded. Good memory. <laughs> well, and I think that, you know, the, 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 the work that we've been doing here in the Southeast around uh, Confederate monument, monumentalism um, doesn't, doesn't succeed a lot of the time, but what it does do is educate. Um, and, and, and what it does do is, is let, let passersby know that there is another way. Um, so I, I, I think, I, I mean, I, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm not someone who, um, who wants to get rid of hope. So ho hope is very important to me. Um, but again, I come back to its specificity. I think it's when it's abstracted that it becomes a problem. Um, and it becomes especially a problem, you know, for, um, for a, a cipher, a cipher for a restoration of the dominant norms. Then that's not, that's not what I mean by hope. But I do, uh, I do, I cling to hope. <laughs> it is, it is the source of, of what keeps me, of what keeps me going um, and makes, makes it, makes it worthwhile. For me, but part of that is that's that that's a word that has meaning to me because it's a word that had meaning to my mother. Um, mm. So I, I'm not going to give up on that word. But but I am very in tune with I think all of the the things that are being said here about what is it we hope for, um, what is it we work for, what is it that we have that we have optimism for or confidence in, and outcomes can't always be that. I recommend the uh, the introductory chapter to an, an old feminist book called the Feminist Ethic of Risk by by Sharon Welch. In the introductory chapter, she does a beautiful criticism of white middle class um, the ethic of control, which she calls the ethic of control, and why we pick up our toys and leave when we can't be assured of the outcome that we think we want. Um, and it's a it's a concise, beautiful helpful, personally convicting and indicting, um, but helpfully illuminating um, description of, of how most of us white people are raised to, um, to not stay in it mm -hmm. and what it might mean to stay in it by, by reshaping what we think about even these terms. Very cool. Friends, I thank you again for another just absolutely riveting hour of conversation on top of again the gift of uh the research and reflections that you've offered over the course of the last two days uh i just have to thank dr tinker dr schneider and dean butler for this conversation which again i've learned a tremendous amount from uh yes uh thank you all also to the many people who sent in questions apologies again that we were not able to get to all of them uh, but thank you so much for the conversation, and I believe we'll be joining back for more events for Remind and Renew in about 15 minutes. So thank you all truly. <laughs>